Welcome to Rising Together, a podcast on the art and design of inclusion. I'm Dr. Elson Haskellar. And I'm Curtis Anderson. Each month, we'll have a special guest, and we'll learn from their personal stories and experiences about how to create change. From thought-provoking discussions to real-life strategies, we'll explore the transformative power of inclusion and discuss how to create a world where every single voice matters. We hope you can join us as we dive into the art of creating inclusive communities. Let's embark on this journey of transformation one story at a time. Stay connected, stay engaged, and more importantly, keep rising with us. Creativity ends up being how you manage projects and how you manage others and how you're able to support a team to take care of the vision. You can catch the latest episodes of Rising Together on the first of every month on Spotify, YouTube, or your preferred streaming platform. Welcome to another episode of Rising Together. We're so honored to have Sarah Kambara with us today. Sarah is a Ringling College graduate with a rich background and experiences from working at Walt Disney Animation to um, currently serving as a producer at Chromosphere. Sarah brings a unique perspective to our discussion. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you, thanks for having me. It means so much to me that you're here. I knew when we were trying to pitch ideas for this episode, I was like, I, I have one, one person in mind, they're perfect, don't even <laughs> ask anyone else, so here it is. Yeah, and you were so excited. I yeah. was, I was like, oh, I got this, I got yes, this, yeah. yes. Because uh, we go way back, you know, you mm -hmm. and I, so that's really fun. Um, yeah. But for those who don't know you, the community, people at large, yeah. who is Sarah? Okay, so I like to give a little of my background whenever I say who I am. Um, I am half Japanese, my dad is from Japan, and then I'm half French Canadian, Quebec. So um, for the most part, I would say now as like an Asian American, um, I've kind of found my place. Over time when I was younger, I was like, who am I? Like, am I like American? Am I Japanese? Like, what is it? But now I just find that I have backgrounds from different places um, and I take that with me in everything I do. Um, and I'm also non-binary, um, yeah. So you studied uh, business of art and design when you were at Ringling College. You mm -hmm. graduated about 10 years ago. And so uh, what made you interested in you know, studying business of art and design? Yeah, well, I always wanted to support artists because my dad, my father was an artist. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I could be there in a way where I would manage and support artists' vision. But I didn't necessarily want to be an artist. Like I always knew I wasn't an artist. And like to this day, I feel that way. I feel like I'm a creative person, but I just needed to be around creativity all the time. Um, and then uh, I know you mentioned yesterday that you didn't, you weren't initially interested in like computer animation, but then you had a lot of friends who were studying computer animation. Yes. So can you explain a little bit, um, yeah. you know, your, your interest in, you know, CA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of my friends were in computer animation and that's why I gravitated to animation in general. Um, I also, um, the person I was dating when I was at Ringling was a computer animation major. So that person taught me a lot about just animation in general, the history of it. And I think that's when it clicked that like it was an industry that I would feel comfortable in um, and also just a place where I could continue working with my friends. We have a, a business program here at Ringling and you know, you said that you well, you weren't you were creative, but you weren't an artist. Like, can yeah. you talk up a little bit about like how that discovery felt? Because I feel like so much of the being a creative and being an artist is so intertwined with one another. Yeah, and that maybe some, some students are probably better suited to go down the business route. Not to say that they're not an artist or creative, mm -hmm. but like being able to separate the two yeah. might actually help you realize like you could thrive in a program like our business program yeah, definitely. and still be around, you know, like you were around animators. And so like, can you, right. can you walk, talk yeah. a little bit about that, that difference between the two? Yes. I think like with the business of art and design program specifically, people don't have to box themselves into like a corporate professional position. Um, I think like creativity ends up being how you manage 
projects and how you manage others and how you're able to support a team to take care of the vision. Mm. Um, and so that's like my creative aspect because I think a lot of the people that I meet are like, oh, you're like a different type of producer. Like I'm so used to producers just showing up, doing the job, moving the schedules along and going home. But you're open to like pivoting. You're open to like finding new opportunities. You're open to figuring out things with our team that's different from just the standard mm -hmm. professional way that a producer would work. Mm -hmm. um, so you started off as a production production assistant at yeah. Walt Disney Animation. Uh -huh. How did you land that, land on that position? Yeah, um, it took a while for me to build it up from sophomore year at Ringling, um, where I met with a recruiter from Disney. Um, and then by my senior year, I was offered the role after having an interview in December of my senior year, but I couldn't take the job after they tried to give it to me. So luckily, after I turned it down, two weeks before graduation, I was offered the production assistant role at Disney Animation. Um, and then, yeah, that was it. Like I just started entry level on Big Hero 6. That's amazing. I so love that movie. <laughs> yes, go on. Thank one. you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yesterday, Sarah was giving a presentation as a part of the career services um, thing. And then they were mentioning, um, how many M Emmys do you have right now? Two. Two, okay. And then you should have seen like our students' faces. They were in awe. Yeah. So um, what, is it, what does it feel like to, to win an Emmy? Mm. It feels good. I think um, like, you know, you, you change and you grow as a person when you're working professionally. There used to be a, like more of an ego part of me that was like, oh, if I get an Emmy, like that's it. That's all I have to do. Um, and I was lucky enough to literally get an Emmy at 27. Um, that was the first one that I got. And then by 29 is when I got the next one. Oh, wow. And by that point, I was pretty much like, I don't need an ego anymore. Like, just drop it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not even 30 and things have worked out really well. I'm like very lucky to be in this position. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of it. Like, I was just grateful, I think, after I received it, which helped me reduced ego, which is a gift to me. Being a student here with you and like seeing how you like flourished and um, like became your own like, like I don't want to say archetype, but when you think business at that time, you know, there was a handful of students mm -hmm. um, who you can think of and they had like their path they were going down, but you decided to go down a different path, right? Mm -hmm. As a business student. Yeah. And so for your capstone project, you were like the first book, BOAD, for those who don't know what BOAD, Business of Art and Design students, mm -hmm. um, to kind of collaborate with another program as part, as, along with their senior capstone project. Yeah. Can you talk about, I mean, I've always wondered this too, as yeah. a friend, <laughs> as someone who's, how did you make that work? Okay, well, to be honest, it was a little bit of a struggle at first. Mm -hmm. um, the computer animation department is like the most prestigious department at that time. I don't know now. I don't know enough to say that about other departments. We are, it's okay. You can still but, say it. Yeah, <laughs> but okay. I'm just saying like back then, 14 years ago, um, it was uh, it was the one that like just did their thing mm -hmm. and they're really good at it. And I was like, well, I need to know how that all works so I can manage it one day. Um, so by sophomore year, I made a game plan to figure out how to start talking to them. Mm. At first, I talked to Jim, the department head, um, and he had some hesitations because he felt like they were in a way like the producer role for their students um, as the ones kind of like managing everything. But I was like, it's not really about that. Like it's about me getting like um, the ability to see what's happening and to support like what they're doing during their process. Right. Um, so, you know, we had to like figure out like, oh, my title isn't a producer, but it's something else. And then, <laughs> and then once we got there to an agreement, just another negotiation situation basically. Um, then my department had also, uh, Jim at the time, stepped in and then met with him. They met one-on-one, -on -one, talked about it, and then I was good to go. That's awesome. Do you see like potentials for the business program to have that type of collaboration with other programs that we offer? Yeah, you know? I think they can do it with any program. Mm. I think like it doesn't even have to be someone's thesis. If there's a certain project within a year 
that makes sense for somebody to step in and help like support creatively and management wise, yeah, go yeah. for it. Like that's what I mean by like being creative about managing. Like, but you need to like see it and be able to like figure it out because you want to do it. Like I saw that through my friends that there was an opportunity when they became juniors and seniors creating a thesis. Like, so once you get on campus at Ringling, like as a BOAS student, like there's so many opportunities. So I'm like, just figure it out, like right. what you like. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's true. So you're highly successful. And then you said that you, you, you're glad that you won two Emmys because like now, you know, you don't, yeah. you don't have an ego. So mm -hmm. um, being a highly successful and driven individual um, right now, we're trying to talk to our students about um, like overcoming failure. In fact, our students are put together at you know um, TEDx event to to talk about that particular theme, yeah. and I see a lot of them suffering from imposter syndrome because okay. I mean, look at our campus; like everyone is so highly you know talented. Yeah. So when you're surrounded by mm -hmm. you know so much talent, then you could start doubting yourself. So I was yeah. wondering if you can share a story of like failure, overcoming a failure from your personal perspective, just to give a little perspective to our students that, sure. you know, you could fail, but it's not about failing, but rather like how yes. to get back up. Yeah. Um, two stories come to mind. One is shorter than the other. I'll start with that one. Um, the first one is when I was in an entry level position at Disney and I was trying to help um, figure out a way for the other production assistants to come together. Actually, all the production management I was trying to organize, that people could come together and figure out like just a program where we could work through um, one of the tech things that we use to show um, all of the stuff on uh, the screens for the directors. Like We would use this certain tech program to show everything to the directors. And I wanted to figure out how we could work together to make it better. And honestly, like. Some of the higher ups um, within the room were very rude to me about like trying to get people together to do this. And I think that just came down to they didn't like that somebody younger was trying to organize a community type situation because the management system was so cutthroat. And like if you aren't just taking care of yourself and moving up, then like that's out of what they're used to. And so they were like, came in with a huge attitude and all this stuff. And then like multiple people had to come and apologize to me afterwards and all this stuff. And I ended up leaving the studio because it wasn't the right fit for me, but that was one situation. Um, and then the other situation was when um, the sec, okay, so this was the Annie Awards and I'm gonna say this in a way where it doesn't like say anything too specific, but um, it was the Annie Awards, and um, one of the main owners of the company of the uh, show that we were nominated for um, had decided to not attend. And usually, if you own the company, you're going to show up and give the speech. And then, like, that owner didn't come to me as the producer and say, hey, can you come give the speech? Netflix had already reached out to me and like set up everything for me to come. And so I was like, how come we haven't had this conversation? Like, you're not even gonna be there. And so I just went for it. Like, I was like, I'm gonna go and give the speech. Like, apparently they decided that another director would take the owner's place, um, but nobody talked to me. So I was like, well, I've been invited at the same level as you, and I'm gonna show up and like make this happen. And then I just went and I gave the speech and like it went really, really well. We won the award. Um, and then even after that, like once we did like a team meeting, like with champagne and all that stuff, like the other owner of the company went up and talked about it as if he was there and he wasn't even there. And it's just like, sometimes you feel like as a person of color, like you aren't seen even though like you're there for so much, you literally showed up, you did the work to support the team, like with your voice, like, and then they don't even acknowledge. And um, to me, it was like, at least I, I did what I thought like I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Wow. That. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's, let's, let's stay in like the, you know, this, this diversity realm, like you mentioned, you know, person, yeah. person of color, uh -huh. like as in, you know, Asian American creative. 
-hmm. Like, how does your cultural, like, you know, your background influence your your process yeah. as a creative? Yeah. Um, I think about this a lot, actually, because I was trying to figure out, like, how do I have such, um, like, organizational skills? And I think it does come from, like, Japanese background. There's a lot, like, just within Japanese culture where... Um, there's respect within how you handle things, how you like understand energy around you and things like that. And so I feel like just ancestrally, like it's in me, mm -hmm. like somehow. And um, I wouldn't say like my dad necessarily like taught me to do that, but I have noticed like, especially when I went to Japan for the first time, like, oh, okay, that's like why I, pe I treat people with respect. I make sure like, um, if they want to get a thought out, like I allow them to do it. And um, yeah, like I think a lot of my organization and discipline mm. comes probably in some way ancestrally for mm. being Japanese. Yeah. And then how do you choose to perhaps like use your cultural background for like storytelling mm -hmm. in your own professional work? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it comes down to the directors like to decide like what they're going to be doing um, if it is like a diverse or cultural voice within something but usually luckily like as the producer like along the way like I can just check in and be like okay like are we sure that this like is still holding up to what um, your vision wanted for like making sure this culture is properly represented and things like that. So I'm kind of like that like background checker to make sure we're getting it right. Um, but usually like the creative already knows like what needs to be shown and said and understood within their storytelling. And do you feel like the, you know, entertainment industry is doing enough to, you know, like tell the stories of um, underrepresented populations? Yeah, I think it's interesting because sometimes um, I feel like the entertainment industry either um, focuses too much on, I guess, trauma in a way, where it's like really intense how they want somebody to understand a culture. And there's nothing wrong with that, but for a while it, it can be like, well, it's not necessarily content that people can go back to over and over again because it's really heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Um, Sometimes, like recently, there's movies where it's great that like they're culturally showing stuff, but it kind of is like done with like jokes, mm -hmm. and that's okay too. But like sometimes I'm like, we're not always like joking about like I'm this and that because I'm this culture like over and over again. Um, so I feel like nowadays, like in the last couple years, there has been more. Um, like moderate levels of like storytelling where it's more a uh, slice of life. And that's been better like to explain cultures. Thank you. Do you feel like the entertainment industry, like their perception of diversity and inclusion has evolved over time? Yes. <laughs> I think it's evolved over time, obviously, because we as people have evolved in how we manage seeing each other and caring for each other. Um, and we're working on it, but we're not there. And so like, yeah, us being more honest about it these days is good, mm -hmm. but some of us are fumbling still, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, what changes would you like to see to promote like a more, for it to continue to move forward? Like if they're taking yeah. baby steps, what would you like to see them take giant steps? Yeah. If you can control um, everything. Yeah, I kind of relate it to how like, things are going with like understanding and respecting gender, like the same way that like you wouldn't necessarily ask someone about their gender if they share and you're like, oh, I wanna know more. Like, because that could literally like elicit a trauma related thing. It's the same with cultures. Like you, you can allow somebody to share who they are, but you don't need to like get to know more just so you can know more. I guess if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears a little bit now. So you're currently working as a producer for Chromosphere. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, the sort of projects that you're working on, your day-to-day -day life, so that like, yeah. our students can know more? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so as a producer, um, the main thing is a client will come to us, uh, specifically at Chromosphere, because we're client-based, service-based, um, and we'll figure out um, 
exactly what it is that they want. So we'll have to do a creative pitch. Like we don't get it right away. Sometimes they say, oh, I have you all in mind and like I just want to give you X amount of money and like get it done. But usually we have to win a pitch and there's multiple people trying to go for the pitch. So our creative director will put together a couple style frames and like just kind of ideation concept sketches together, pitch it to the client, and then the client will say yes or no, and then we'll negotiate rates based off of our entire team. Um, once we get the bid, then um, we start the process, and all of the rates and everything that we figured out is applied to a schedule already. Um, so we just go department by department and get it done. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sounds so together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a structure. Yeah. yeah. Oh my stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So you worked on so many different projects. Um, mm -hmm. Some for Netflix. You mentioned. Yeah. Can you like pick one that's your favorite? Is that possible? Yeah, it's yeah. possible. Definitely. Um, the one that I like the most is City of Ghost. It's a show on Netflix. Um, the director is Elizabeth Ito, and I really like it because it covers a lot of um, cultures within Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and it does it in a way that, like, it's kind of like um, like fake docu style. So all of the people that are within it are people that are from Los Angeles and within the certain neighborhoods. Um, like one focuses on like a Japanese restaurant and how um, the grandma had owned the restaurant, and then. Um, yeah, it just, it goes to different places. It talks about the Tongva culture within LA, um, the original ancestral people who had been there. Um, and yeah, I just really like this project because kind of like I said, like more of a moderate tone where it's just people um, being who they are and it's still being like a really good platform for animation. Mm -hmm. That's been my favorite so far. So you're, you mean, you're, you're killing it. You're a boss, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean. She's got two Emmys. It's two more than I have. Yeah. So uh, looking forward, like, like what are some of your, like, your own aspirations and goals that you want to do both personally and professionally? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll start with professionally. But um, I have always wanted to do more humanitarian type stuff mm -hmm. where it's not like I'm working on something and it goes out to the public, but I'm not like around the people, you know? Cause like we make stuff, it's on streamers, it's on in theaters, whatever. But I'll hear sometimes from parents like, oh, I really love Storybots, I love this for my kid. And that's great. But I want like more of a like in-person um, experience with like people like being able to use the animation or whatever the content is. Um, so right now, luckily, we've um, been working with a government grant with the Department of Education on a product that is um, like STEAM-based curriculum. Cool. And so it's for grades uh, fifth through, or sorry, second through, it's for grades second through fifth. And they're able to, the students are able to go through the book. Um, one topic is how do we get water? And so they're learning the factual like science facts while they're going, but then they're also learning how to break down what they come across. So maybe they come across like a caterpillar. And so we're teaching them step-by-step step how to draw it. And then we created an app that scans in each section that they drew, and then it animates their drawings for them. I so they it. see their own drawings animated. That's cute. Also within the app. And then it the app also continues to tell you like scientific facts. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited. Oh, you would love that. Yes, yes. I'm really excited about that because finally, like, we're able to do a product that, like, we can go around the world and, like, teach um, people at that age where it's so integral at that age because there's statistics that by age six, for example, girls may question their brilliance. They may question, like, oh, I'm not smart enough, like, in science. Mm. I'm not this and that. So we wanted to focus on, like, creating a product that's like steam based, but also art based because some people also question, am I not artist? Like, right. I'm not good at that either. So we're like, let's do it both. Like we're really passionate about both. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So now, yeah, I'm excited. Like I, I didn't know what it was. I was just like, I want to do something more like human 
focus. That's like, amazing. I got yeah. two girls, so definitely, definitely yes. getting the app. So when is it yes. going to be available? Um, okay, I mean, we got the phase one grant and we just finished the eight months. We did our research study um, and a couple after school programs. Um, and we're hoping to get the phase two grant, which is two years yeah. and a lot more money. But um, yeah, it takes a bit of time because we've never done like products. We've only done service base. Yeah. So we're developing like all these different things for like commercialization and all that. Wow. Yeah. Sounds but maybe like... in like three years. Okay. Yeah. She'll be old enough. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. definitely. I feel like I just was, you just told me something I shouldn't know. Like this is amazing. I know. Like, uh... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But um, you just mentioned something that that really triggered my interest. Um, so when did you, w w was there a point in your career, in your life where you felt like I am good enough? Like I am mm -hmm. good enough. Mm -hmm. I am a good artist. And yeah. I sort of like discovered your value. Mm -hmm. It sort of like goes back, you know, to the stuff that we've been like talking about with imposter syndrome and failures yeah. and, and all that stuff. And right. um, so was there, what, what was that like turning point for you? Yeah. Uh, hmm. I mean, I, I think after getting the Emmys, it was like the first spark where I actually wasn't even sure like if I would stay in animation because it felt like almost like a formula in a sense of like a project is like this, we do this. And um, I just needed to make sure I was having something that fed me. So luckily at Chromosphere, we do projects that does that for me. Um, so that was a turning point in a way. And then um, this is like kind of a funny way to think about it, but by 30, your brain fully develops. And I feel like that's the age that I started to take care of a lot of like self care things because I have a number of mental health disorders um, that I've been working through over the last three years because I'll almost be 33. Um, and that has been a big turning point for me, like just as a human, like to be like, okay, now I like understand how I can focus on things and figure things out for myself. Let's go back. You said like 14 years. I'm like, gosh, has it really been that long? So for you, it's been 10. Well, right? I guess from when I first came, it was like as a freshman right. and then because I graduated in 2014. Right. When did you yeah. graduate? Just 20, on camera? 2013. <laughs> 2012. Oh, 2012. 2012, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Who's so you've been out for 10 years. And yeah. so like looking back the last 10 years from where you're sitting at now to, mm -hmm. you know, kicking back and knowing you just turned in your thesis project, like what are some <laughs> of the, what are some of your fondest memories, you know? Of Ringling or? Just in the last in 10 general. years. Like, or maybe, like what that's kind of pushed you to where you are now. That's, that's kind of helped shape the goals that you wanted to set yeah. for yourself. It did kind of start from my community in computer animation at Ringling. Like I literally live in a house in LA across the street from friends that I had wanted to be around at this point in my life. And I am. So that's like that's the most important to me, like the community of people that I want to be with, um, just period. Yeah. Yeah. It's in school. You're kind of forced to being around people, yeah. you know, and now as an adult, you can mm -hmm. kind of choose the people who influence you. Right. And if you see those people that your community doing things that chasing dream, doing more humanitarian things, that's like only going to help propel you to want to do more of those things. Mm -hmm. Do you, where did you start to feel like I can pick and choose projects that I really want to do? That oh, I really good like? question. Yes. Um, I think I started to feel it in my first job <laughs> when I was at Disney um, because they're very like bottlenecked on how you can move up. And that just made me feel like, well, if you're going to keep me in this role longer than I need to be, I need to find like other projects that I want to be doing. Um, and so moving around really helped me because I learned more like the right fit of people that I would be working with day to day. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you clarify what moving around entails? Like you're still in the same job, but you're just taking on different projects, like, like lateral yeah, projects? Yeah, so it started like Disney, I was a production assistant and then I wanted to be a production coordinator, but they couldn't get me there quick enough. So I went to Pixar, became a production coordinator. And then um, I heard that Jib Jab was hiring 
for production coordinator, but I wanted to be a producer. So I called them and said, I can be a production coordinator, but I really want to be a producer. And then within three months, I was a producer because I proved it to them. Wow. Um, That's amazing. And then from there, I did, you know, the two seasons of the show for Netflix. And then it became that formula thing where I was like, I just feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again now. And like as a producer at this point. Right. Um, and I need to find a place where um, I feel more creative, I guess. And so Chromosphere, because they're client based and it'll be like different places like Airbnb or Google will call us up and like ask us for different things versus like I'm just working on a show that just one creator wants to do. Um, I'm allowed to do a lot of different That's good. projects. I have a question for you mm -hmm. regarding the use of AI. Everyone's talking about it. Um, yeah. Like, what are your thoughts? Like, how are you seeing it being used in the yeah. industry? Your projections? Yeah. Give yeah, us a give us a thesis on it. Right yeah, now. Okay. students are very afraid of it. Okay. Well, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I think it's just another tool that we are introducing into our toolkit, I guess. Um, and the reason for that is there are very brilliant creatives that I know myself that have tried to do trial runs with AI, seeing if AI was going to generate something better than them as a designer, like renowned designer. And it did not. And I guess that's just to say that AI is helpful as a tool to pull together something that you can reference. Um, it's helpful for people who don't necessarily do art themselves to pull packets together, things like that. But it can't necessarily, at the level of brilliance of a human that has creative background, actually generate the same thing that they can create. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I feel about it right now. It's a tool, but it's not necessarily us. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. I mean, so like, were the people who are introducing it in your toolkit Mm -hmm. Like, were they afraid to introduce it, or was it something like, no, they were, they just were like, curious. let's just do it? Okay. Yeah, they were like, you know what, this weekend I'm going to give it a go, and I'm going to see if it can actually generate something that I would create, and it couldn't. That's yeah. cool. Like, you don't approach it with fear. It's more of a curiosity, yes. and let that shape yeah. your judgment. At that point in your career, like, you've generated such a catalog of, like, what people are able to, like, work off of, because, like, your art style is like so different from others that you do kind of have that like uniqueness. So you're not like, oh, like this computer is gonna like be better than me. Do you see know. it shaping jobs? Maybe not like in the, like a designer trying to see if it replicates their design skills, but any other, you know, facets of the pipeline, either pre-production, production or post-production where AI could, you know, I don't want to say, I'm not afraid of it, but you know, where some people could be like, I don't want to use it, I'm afraid to use it. I don't want to be curious about it. Do you see like any, like, I can see why you're worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, to an extent, but I also feel like, <laughs> like even, like you could say like, oh, I'm going to have AI replace my production assistant so AI can run the reviews instead of my production assistant. Is that AI going to know when like somebody's missing from the room? No. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Are they going to be able to pick up the phone and run the review at the same time and call the people and make sure things are happening? No. So like, there's always things that the AI can't accomplish because it can't multitask as more than um, one thing that's focusing on what it's asked to do. Yeah. It also doesn't have any critical thinking. Yeah. Um, and it's like when it comes to art, um, you know, it has to pull what it's been. It has to pull from what it's been like. Put in so yes. because we don't have a great diversity of like artworks, so all of the yeah, stuff that yeah. it's pulling is just very yes, yeah. There's um, I mean, I guess just also with that um, designer that I was talking to about the trial run, um, a lot of copyright issues. Mm -hmm. wow. The oh, things yeah. that are pulled in, you can't, you couldn't put that out as a final piece. No, there's no way you get sued left and right. So it's not there for creatives qu quite yet. Maybe there's some roles that they're like. It's good enough to cover it, but I feel like that's an unfortunate move too. Do you have any advice for our students? Like if yes. you were to give one piece of advice, the what would that be? The biggest advice that I did not do when I was a student was self-care. 
<laughs> yeah. I did not sleep. I was working four jobs. I was like hustling. I know. They forget and to eat. Yeah. That yeah. blows my mind. All of that. And I'm like, it honestly needs to happen sooner. And it needs to happen, like it needs to be taught in elementary school. So that's my biggest advice. Like self-care is health care. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sleep, eat. Yeah. Take some time to do to your yourself. essentials. Go outside, just yeah. go sit in the sun. I know, yeah. yeah. Connect with somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. that is so healing. For me, that is so healing. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Like, <laughs> I don't like, know. I don't know, think so. You, I'm yeah. just so happy to see you. You know, yeah. like, I think, like, you know, we talked yesterday. There are a handful of people who you choose to be around. And you choose to keep in touch with, right? Because I don't live yeah. in California, but yeah. you know, every time I think you were here a couple of years ago, we like walked through campus, like here's what you're missing, what's going on in yeah. your life, like that's life giving, right? And those are the things that keep us moving forward as like creatives and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm yeah. really happy to see where you've come, yeah, in the last, you know, yeah. 10 thanks years. for inviting me. Oh yeah, this yeah. is good. Thank you so much for coming. It's important for me to connect to everybody here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that concludes today's conversation. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on this journey of design and inclusion. You can find all of our episodes, transcripts, and other wonderful resources on our website, ringling.edu backslash rising together. Join us next time for more insightful conversations. And remember to stay connected, stay engaged, and keep rising together with us. Rising Together is produced at the Soundstage in partnership with Studio Labs and Art Network at Ringling College of Art and Design. The show is produced by Dr. Elson Haskeller, Curtis Anderson, Keith Elliott, Nick Paldino, Troy Logan, and Marquis Doyle.